welcome to the Barcelona Podcast, episode 165, and this will continue to brought to you by the most influential voices in the FC Barcelona community. I'm Dan Hilton, and who else is joining me today? But Frances Tomas, we've got a win that we can talk about uh, coming off a 4-1 victory over Celta de Vigo over the weekend, Frances. But I think rain, sun, win, or lose, it seems like the same things happen with the Barcelona fan base, don't they? Exactly. Um, to be honest, uh, regular listeners know I don't really follow the fan base that much. I've watched the matches and I mostly sort of create my own opinions. So I don't really know where the fan base is going with this. Um, all I know is that the game was won, that um, basically we got the best player in the world. I think that's no news to anyone. But that doesn't hide the fact that the team behind and obviously driven by the manager is not firing in all the cylinders we should expect. No, and in our La Ronda questions, we're going to talk about potentially some of the reasons for that. Uh, let's get right into it. We do have a La Ronda, uh, it's not a La Ronda special, but we have dipped into our Facebook closed Facebook group. That's tbpod.link backslash group. You can get again, deeper dives there, and that's where we ask and get our La Ronda listener questions. So if you do have a listener question, just join the closed Facebook group, answer the questions. It's easy as pie, and then you're going to get to hear the questions that we have today, and that's why we, when, especially when it's Frances and I, we break down these questions and give some good answers. We're going to start with a question from Izzy, uh, and I think this is going to be the broad, grand stroke, and sometimes we do do La Gran Pregunta, and I, I think if there's anyone that fills that role today, it's this question from Izzy, is Griezmann the new Coutinho, a signing we didn't need, but yet the board made? Not really. Uh, they're different players. I think Coutinho was successful at Liverpool, and uh, everyone thought he was a great sign-in, and then when he came here... He failed to adapt, but obviously the reasons for his lack of adaptation was mostly the fact that his position didn't quite exist at Barca. He was brought in mostly as a replacement to Iniesta, but then people quickly realized Iniesta's replaceable. And Coutinho's, I, would, I don't want to say his attitude throughout, but um, obviously his lack of adaptation to the environment, to the expectation. Um, when he wasn't at the spotlight, he wasn't really sort of shining. And he didn't quite understand what the system was about. I'm not saying the manager should have done this, but the the, the, the scheme wasn't changed for him either, um, which I think is the right thing to do, to be honest. But um, no, he just lost the Camp Nou straight away. Um, I would say after three, four months, there was the traditional run run being heard all around the Camp Nou. Run run is the, the Catalan word for complaint, basically, especially at the Camp Nou. And... Um, for him, it was the lack of attitude. It was um, his lack of ability to sort of convey any feeling beyond his own self towards the towards the people in the stadium, towards his own teammates, and obviously everyone watching around the world. I think Griezmann is different. I think Griezmann comes from a much more sort of hardworking philosophy, uh, and that is ingrained in him. So he's not sort of with Klopp in Liverpool but he's with Simeone in Atletico, but the things he's learned from it and he's taking it as part of his baggage when he's, he's coming to Barca. And I think the fact that Griezmann leaves everything on the pitch every single time excuses his um, apparent and quite obvious lack of adaptation so far. And I think that's the main reason. I think Griezmann tries much harder than Coutinho ever did. I do want to talk about the ascension of both these players at Barcelona when they just showed up. And you mentioned when Coutinho, he actually started on a pretty good foot when he came in January. It's not that he was playing regularly with Liverpool in the Champions League uh, and the Premier League, but he wasn't completely shut out by Klopp. There were, certainly he had a limited role, what would have been the fall uh, two seasons ago. But in, 15, in the first 15 games for both these players, Coutinho, two goals, Five assists, so uh, seven points, if you will, total, bringing in uh, some two goals, five assists for Barcelona. Griezmann, meanwhile, in his first 15 games now, four goals, three assists. So same amount of uh, seven total, uh, we'll say helpers, to the team. But for Griezmann, the more interesting thing is you talked about positional sense. 11 matches as a left winger for Griezmann, obviously with Suarez and Messi. Two goals, one assist. Four matches as center forward this year, two goals, two assists. And those goals and an assist coming back against Real Batiste and their awful defense. Sorry, Mark Bartra. Uh, but I think you hit the nail on the head about the big fundamental difference between the two is that if when Coutinho last season, things really didn't work out, and not even just in his body language, but on the field, he really did feel like a, a man without a plan, a man without a position. And for all the talent that Barcelona do boast in midfield, 
while they're high end talent up top with when it comes to Messi and and Suarez and every year that we talk about Suarez that that narrative changes a bit but Griezmann was able to fit in defensively as you mentioned he'll fit into any team in the world defensively and if Coutinho isn't giving you offensively what he was brought in to do obviously Coutinho not the best one-on-one defender either and he's not going to help that defensive shape and I think Coutinho led to even more issues on that side of the the ball but Griezmann because of what he's going to do that Diego Simeone is ingrained into him that he's going to give you that work rate match in and match out for as long as he's on the pitch and that is an important thing and I think another thing that scopes this this signing interestingly enough for Griezmann is that both came for 120 million euros but Coutinho came after Neymar's departure and that money was all we knew exactly what was happening with that money in a summer that also included Dembele uh, but it's interesting to me that Griezmann's signing came reportedly after Barcelona had to take a loan out to afford him. So it fe- it almost feels like Griezmann is the more luxury signing when Coutinho was the necessary signing to be to have those those funds used. And I, I'm, it's funny to me that we don't shape it that way. And I say that, but maybe it's just yet. If Griezmann winds up, if, if it's January or February and he still only has four goals and three assists, and now we're talking 25 games for Barcelona... Uh, then I think the, the alarm bells will start to be rung. But I, I still don't worry about it because of the old adage that Messi always says. It takes time to get used to Barcelona's system. And if you're playing with Messi and Suarez up top, and especially in Valverde's defensive system, Griezmann has to cover for Suarez and for Messi, and he has to put himself in positions to defend. That's his number one job in Valverde's system. More so, and find Suarez and find Messi in the spots where they put the ball in the back of the net. That's his job so far, and it takes a while for especially attackers to get accustomed to playing the team. That's why some attackers might come in and will never sniff the field. Defenders don't sniff the field because, and we'll talk about this later about some of the guys that look to be frozen out, but defenders don't see the field because it's not advantageous, obviously, for a manager to take out a center back when he doesn't have to, where it's the, the guys who run a little more, the attackers, they're the ones that you worry about. And Griezmann is certainly one of those, but he's able to play 90 minutes, and I, I'm still going to give him a leash in the same way that we gave Coutinho that full spring when he looked fine, and we weren't worried about him last summer. Exactly. And another point that you sort of touched upon is the fact, is the word luxury really, is the fact that Griezmann was signed as should have been a centre striker, centre forward, and that's not really where he's playing. Um, I think that that doesn't make much sense, to be honest. And um, another point that you sort of passed upon, there's no way that Barca, given the fact that the players are not firing at all cylinders, the still far away from the 100%. We should not have two players that can afford to not defend. Um, obviously, Messi, we know that he recharges batteries. We know that he needs to be sharp moving forward. We know that when he gets the ball, he can just zoom past pretty much anybody. We also know that um, we learned that over the weekend even more. Um, taking a free kick for him is like taking a penalty. So fair enough, Messi needs his rest uh, on a defensive uh, mechanism in order to recharge. But Suarez should not afford that luxury. I don't think there's anything that justifies the centre forward of a team that already has Messi in it in terms of the lack of defensiveness, you want to call it that. Um, I don't think we can afford that. So I think it's up to the manager to know and realise that in 2019, going into 2020 very soon, so Suarez at 32 years of age in the current Barca cannot afford the luxury of not running back. He is someone who needs to be pressuring. He's someone who needs to be... Um, annoying, not just whenever he feels like it and there's the ball sort of on the attacking end, but also defensively, because the team obviously lacks that composure, like that lacks solidity, and it is extremely necessary that he adds up. Um, Griezmann would have been a great solution as centre forward, but so, um, Belverde is not really playing him there, even when Suarez has been pretty much injured, and that doesn't make much sense. No, it doesn't, and I, I think that's the big difference between the two as well. Coutinho, as you mentioned, was brought in to be a replacement for Iniesta, but it, it, it almost isn't a like-for-like like replacement. In the same way, Griezmann, I think, was brought in to bridge that gap between a, a younger generation and Messi and Suarez. And so the, the, I think the most important impact that Griezmann's going to make for Barcelona, it might not even be this season. It might need to be in two years. Now, he'll be uh, around 30, 31 at that time, but that'll be the time when Griezmann has all the spotlight on him as Messi and Suarez have either aged out completely or uh, certainly Suarez, but maybe Messi has taken a much more reduced role in the team at that point. Uh, So Griezmann's going to be expected to be the guy at some point in his Barcelona career 
And because of Suarez and Messi, it's not yet even the season. While Coutinho, again, was brought in to basically having to replicate and be Andres Iniesta, a role that, again, was never going to fit. So I think that's the big difference here that for Griezmann, I think his story is just yet to be written just because of uh, the narrative and a lot of different things that go into that. Uh, and going off that, Roman asks... So how are we feeling given that Messi has saved the team again, has now passed the ball a few times to Griezmann? This in uh, reference to the fact that media, obviously a lot of slanderous media, was reporting that Griezmann and Messi were having issues and that he was purposely not passing to him and X, Y, Z. Roman also mentioned that uh, Sergio Busquets scored his, uh, we'll call it a yearly goal, which was a pretty nice finish as well. Uh, For me, Frances, I'm not going to spend too much time on this question because I'm not worried about that Messi-Griezmann connection. Uh, as far as Griezmann getting accustomed to Barcelona's system, it has to do with Griezmann working with everybody on the team, not just Messi. And even when we've seen at times players come in like a Firpo, or I find even Arturo Vidal and Griezmann spatially, uh, they both have this defensive mind. They both like to get after it, but they don't know exactly where to be defending in relation to one another. And all those things take time. Offensive side of the ball, defensive side of the ball. Uh, and Messi, again, his mind just works so quickly. You as a player have to adapt and figure out uh, and almost get up to speed. And that is a difficult thing because, as Antoine Griezmann said, he kind of has to knock some of that Diego Simeone out of him because he's already defending while they still have the ball. And that's just Diego Simeone's way to do it. And so Griezmann kind of has to get that out of his system and learn how to play with Messi. And that's fine. That's something, again, that I, 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 we can revisit this in January or March or at the end of the season, but I'm not worried right now. No, definitely not. And also, I think that if someone is spending the whole of the Barca game counting how many passes go from one pass to the other, either that's their only job or they're not really watching the game itself. Um, I think that Messi and Griezmann are both professionals. They know exactly what to do to win and they just need to get used to each other in order to do it. Um, In terms of Arturo Vidal, um, (laughs) I really don't want to live in a world in which Arturo Vidal is our number 10. You know, what we traditionally at Barca know as a number 10, Messi is sort of the one. Yeah, great point. That that's like that's a more worrying sign that, that Artur Vidal was at times playing the number 10 role against Celta exactly. Vigo. That's a worrying exactly. sign. <laughs> exactly, without a doubt. So if you put together a team that has Messi who doesn't defend, but moving forward, he's amazing, obviously. You've got Suarez who doesn't really care defensively anymore because he doesn't have the, doesn't have the stamina um, anymore. And then you've got Artur Vidal who is a creative player. That's not a recipe for success, you know. Um, for the first time in a long, long time, I actually watched full matches from other teams this weekend. Um, I think that's quite a worrying sign from a personal perspective. Um, I tend to watch 10, 20 minutes of any other game and then just get bored um, and think, you know, Barca are so much better. But actually, this weekend, I found myself watching other teams and thinking, how on earth are we ever going to cross, say, Liverpool or Manchester City um, and beat them in the Champions League? Um, I, I just don't see it, you know, and I probably took the question on a tangent here and sort of digressed quite a bit. But it is a worrying sign that Barca supporters, because I'm sure it's not just myself, you know, we're watching other teams and thinking we are wasting our time here. And perhaps more importantly, we're, wait, we're wasting Messi's prime uh, being coached by somebody who thinks Arturo Vidal can be um, the, the, the best threat from the middle. It just it, it baffles me, honestly. Yeah, well, in your defense, and uh, listeners know that I do tend to dip dip my eyes as as much as I can into other games uh, around the week, and just to understand trends and uh, understand future opponents for Barcelona, as you mentioned. And I think everybody was there; the eyes were all on Liverpool against Man City this week in a game that could have uh, decided the Champions League. And there's a lot of memes coming out of uh, Pep Guardiola, and we do see the extremes of the way that modern football uh, certain matchups work out the way it is, and Man City. Whatever way it works out, they don't wind up being good against Liverpool. But I think, yeah, at Barcelona fans, you hear so many that you they watch a Man City game, especially one that Man City dominates, and that's the big difference. That Pep's team, even though they're losing to a, another top team in Liverpool and potentially losing out in the Premier League, when Pep's teams play, we'll say, the bottom dwellers, the cellar dwellers, they utterly dominate them nine times out of a 10 or 19 times out of 20 with North City being, uh, I think, basically almost the one exception this year for Man City. And yet there's so many points off of Liverpool because other top clubs are taking some points off them. But again, I think Kules would live with that as opposed to Barca won 4-1, but it all came through free kicks. It So very little came through the run of play. And that was a big issue. So Can I add in there, Dan? Um, the Liverpool and Man City both play like the co- coaches want them to play. They have got a very clear 
very well known now and sort of identifiable identity that everyone relates to. Everyone knows. Everyone knows that if you play against a club team, they're going to play a particular way with the counter with the counter pressing, with the intensity from the first to the 97th minute. If, if that happens, and with Guardiola, we all know what it will get. You know, it's a Barca podcast. I don't need to over explain there. The current Barca team, you take Messi out, and there's not much left. Um, not from the manager not from anyone else on the bench and I don't think the players themselves know what, what's going on, you know. There were team, there were times in the previous, not just the last game, but the one before that as well. Barca was playing a 4-2-1 with the three, sort of with the two open uh, wingers and then the striker with the one behind the striker being Arturo Vidal. This is not the Barca that I don't think any of our listeners fell in love with. This is not something that I would say 99% of the current fan base can be proud of. Um, I used to go to work on a Monday. Now, obviously, I live in the Middle East, so it's a Sunday. But um, I used to go to work all proud of the team that, that I supported. And, and people used to come to me, did you watch this? Did you see that? Oh, my God, it was fantastic. Now, all people don't really mention Barca anymore. And when they come to mention Barca to me, it's all about, did you see the Messi free kick? There's nothing else beyond it. So something something has to give, something has to change. And we are in that situation that it is dangerous because, you know, we've always said that uh, teams like, I don't know, the Golden State Warriors or Barca and the Guardiola is a very bandwagon I don't, I don't know if that's even a term, but people sort of get on, get on the bandwagon and just keep moving forward. But people are going to leave Barca's bandwagon, which, I, to be honest, I don't really care about because that's beyond my... Yeah. <laughs> I've been supporting Barca all my life. It doesn't matter to me. But the thing is, the popularity of the team, the the... The gancho, the attractive, the attractiveness of the team for for the neutrals is just not going to be there anymore, and they're going to go as well, which is not the biggest problem. But I think it's quite telling of the current situation we're in. Yeah, I think the kids like to use the term plastics. Uh, it seems to be the word that's being used where you get. Fans. I'm not a kid, Dan. I've never heard of plastic. <laughs> I clearly, plastic I clearly am not. Bag is made of. Clearly, clearly, I'm not either. And, and <laughs> I think the, the point that us old fogies are what, really what we're calling that is that, and we know this that that dynastic sports work in cycles. You bring up the Warriors and you know they, they're one of the worst teams in the NBA this season because the cycle has, Kevin Durant has left and it seems like the cycle has ended. And it, it, it goes through just whether it's age, whether it's it's money, whatever it is. Uh, again, all sports wind up being in cycles. And even look at Manchester United. Their cycle lasted a, lasted a long time and now it's taking them a while to dig themselves back, back out. And I think the one final point I want to make here before we move on to the next question is that Passion is another part of this when we talk about watching some of the other matches I did this weekend. And Liverpool-Man City, there was certainly a buzz around that for, for all the reasons we know. But when Real Betis and, and, and Sevilla met up this weekend in the, mm-hmm. in the Seville derby, you could feel that Real Betis hasn't been the greatest this season. And Sevilla have been fine in their results, but they haven't really been dominant either. Uh, they have got off on the front foot in, in, good matches, in, in some matches, and they have, uh, under Lepertegui, been uh, quick to the ball this season. But that said, there is a buzz around that kind of derby. And for Barcelona, because they're so dominant against a, a team that might get relegated this year in Espanyol, the only time there's any buzz is, is about Real Madrid. And that buzz is conjured up, obviously, by the media, is conjured up by the, the fans there, and that's going to be Real Madrid. But what other kind of matches do you see that Barcelona players, that there's this passion, like there's this thing that they have to get up to? There just seems to be a, a reverence to the team. And I, I'm not asking, again, for the players to be giving more. Uh, I'm not questioning how much the Barcelona players love the badge and, and, and love to play for the club. But I think it's almost on... I'm almost putting the blame some of this on the supporters, on the media, on those around the club, that there just doesn't seem to be any buzz around anything outside of El Clasico, which wasn't even played <laughs> this, this year, cause it was, yep. they, cause it, and it was pushed off because we were worried, obviously, and we talked about that uh, a few shows ago, about you know what's happening in Barcelona as well. So yeah, other than Real Madrid, uh, you know, that's the only derby that seems to, to inject any energy or passion into the supporters and the fan base. And, you know, this is actually a perfect transition. We're talking about blame now. That Eric asks, if you were to assign blame for the current malaise of the team, what percentage would you put on the board for player acquisitions and the makeup of the squad? What percentage to the manager for tactics and player motivation? And what percentage to the players for lack of execution for all those different things? And, um, you know, it's funny that he, Eric asked this question, and yet I'm even adding how much do the supporters uh, deserve some of the, some of the blame? How much... Uh, to the uh, to the media uh, for kind of knocking home some narratives, and you know, you look at the the, the games the last two weeks that the, the fans just jeering and and booing, and uh, I don't know if the, the 
players necessarily deserve that at the moment yet in the season, but I don't know. Uh, out of 100, Frances, what do you give it? We'll, we'll, just, we'll just knock it down to board manager players. I'm not going to make it too complicated. Very simply, 100% on the board. Um, I hmm. think that the board has the power to change everything else. So the blame has to be 100% on the board. I mean, in, in my other life beyond the podcast, um, I am a leader in a, in a company and I've got the power to change things. And when someone doesn't perform, it's my job to decide, to work out, to analyze, and ultimately to remove or to re-employ or to train whoever is underperforming. If you've got an employee, which is the, the, the most important employee in the whole of your squad, in the whole of your team, who is the manager, who is underperforming and you haven't changed it, then that's going to reflect on you. It's not bad on the manager. I mean, you could put a monkey to train Barca tomorrow. It's not the monkey's fault. You can put, a, I don't know, a chair uh, or a pink hippopotamus to, to coach the team. That's, that's not the hippopotamus's fault. That's whoever chose that person. You know, I think it was crystal clear after the, oh, after the season last year, after the Liverpool disaster, that we needed a change of manager. And I think everyone agreed. I think a lot of people within the squad, and I'm assuming during the board, people, you know, they watch every game. They can't be blind. And they decided not to make the change. So I, I don't know how, much, how effective our change of manager today would be. Um, I, what I certainly do know is that it should have been done four months ago during the summer. So whoever was coaching next had enough uh, preseason, had enough time, had enough... Um, chances to to model the squad to decide a little bit on the signings that were coming and then take things forward that uh, right now you know what are we no, november mid-november now who are you going to put to 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 take the reins now who, who's going to yeah. lead this group of players who wouldn't be his and and take anything better than the current manager is i i don't see it so 100 percent on the board I, I think the supporters i don't think would ever be to blame um unless they're socios because obviously if they're club members, which are the socios, they've got the right to vote. So arguably, they're the ones that put the board in charge. Fair enough. But um, right now, the, 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 I don't know, the fan base has the right to say whatever they want. You know, we're saying whatever we want. And so is um, every single one of our listeners. And uh, as much, I'm not on Twitter anymore. I, know, I think everyone knows that. But whoever's saying whatever on Twitter, that's their right to say it. I, I put no blame on the supporters. Um, the media are doing their job. Um, I think the media over the last 10, 15 years has changed dramatically with the rise of the internet and social media. And they just want to put um, a clickable headline and with a very weird photograph that people want to click on. And, you know, that's how they get money these days. And they're just doing their job. I don't think they're to blame the players. They're in the team because the board decided to employ a manager and they both together decided to keep those players in the squad. So I don't think it's the players' fault either. Obviously, the players can give more. But then again, they're employees and they're managed by a leader who doesn't motivate them at all because, you know, he's been there three years. He's failed two of the two years that they were there. Um, and it's all about tactics. It's all about uh, mechanisms. But the thing is, the tactics are embedded and the tweaks that are needed this season really needed someone fresher to come and implement them. So I don't want to break down to 97 percent or anything, 100 yeah. percent to the board. And that's yeah. that. Yeah, and, and when it comes to, and we spoke about this at length about Valverde the last two weeks, so I'm not going to get into that, uh, diving deep into whether or not he belongs there again. We're not doing that. But what I will say, a plug for the YouTube video this week, and apologies, I didn't get one out last week because I was moving, but this week I will have one out about Helenio Herrera, actually, and some of the comparisons and then some of the stark differences between he and Ernesto Valverde. And when I talk again about the cycles that in this third season, it's not that things are going sour for Valverde, they're going sour in a different way, and Valverde will wind up being, as, as managers always are, it's, it's 100% of the time the case that the managers wind up being the scapegoat. Uh, certain players might be blamed first, and so they wind up being kicked out of the club, but, I, I, but fully and completely for a season. You're not going to blame one individual player for a season going awry. You'll blame that, that, that player for his career and for his time at the club not going right. But you blame a manager for a season when results don't happen. They're the ones, obviously, that fall on the sword. Uh, and when it comes to Helena Herrera, a lot of differences with, with, with Valverde uh, persist, uh, but in the same regard, in his third season at Barcelona, some interesting things happen there. So there's the plug for that, and if, if you're... Dan, can I go here? I never do this, but I really feel like it's about time that I did this. Um, we always make the shows, and, and you prepare so much, 
Um, you put so much preparation for this this uh, podcast that we publish every single week. Um, I prepare very little, as you know. <laughs> I just <laughs> pretty much turn turn the phone on and, and just answer your questions that I haven't even read before uh, on purpose, to be honest. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone who continues to post the questions, is keeping the um, the Barcelona podcast group alive sort of thing. Uh, we don't have many members. We are really selective to the people that uh, actually access the, the group. There are groups of Facebook that are, I don't know, 100,000 uh, people in it. And our club only has 500. Um, I think that is the number that we want to be interacting with every single person and we want everyone to actually be real fans and actually real listeners to the podcast. Um, so I'm very grateful for the interactions that go on there. I'm very grateful for all the different debates and definitely whenever we ask for questions, we don't really give much notice. We give like, I don't know, 15, 20 hours and we've got countless amounts of questions that allow us to make this, this program. So I just want to thank the listeners and particularly everyone in the Facebook group for making this podcast possible. And just one little thing, if you are still listening to the podcast today, you haven't got tired of us yet, um, you must have a Kule friend with a phone somewhere. So can you please share the link to the podcast or can you talk about us to your friend so that we continue to grow? I know we never really do this. And when Dan does all the plugs, he's sort of at the end of the episode. But I just want to put it sort of halfway in the middle. I haven't discussed this with Dan beforehand. But if you can recommend us to just one person, then we will continue to grow and we will get our, our opinions in more ears. So thank you very much in advance. Yeah, I, I, to pull back the curtain even a little farther, Francesca, that's a great point. I, I was actually going to this week ask, remind people to go on iTunes and give us some, or wherever you listen to the pod, go and give us a review and a rating. Because it seems to me, and actually I did some research across all the different, we'll say, uh, not necessarily coming from Barca TV or, or one of the big, big companies, uh, obviously that produce media, whether it's being sports or whoever it is, for being an independent Barcelona related or the Liga related uh, piece of media, if you will, I find that across all of those different, and you know who they are, I don't need to say the names, but you know, we've had a lot of them on as guests as well. All of our numbers are down, believe it or not, across the board, because when we talk about the malaise about the club and boring and all these different things, it does actually affect our numbers, it affects how much we care about the club. Uh, and it's almost a thing where if the club isn't going to support us and uh, or we feel like the club's not doing its job on the on the field to make it enjoyable for us, uh, I think we as a, a Barcelona community have to remember that's how I start every 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 show here about the Barcelona community. So by sharing the show and by doing a rating this week and all those different things, I want to try to find those other people who are going to be excited about the club when uh, either we start a new cycle of success or find our way even this season. Uh, and I want the people that are most excited about that. Uh, so just making sure that everybody who wants to find this can find it. And there are ways to definitely help us out. So I do appreciate, uh, as always, everything that everybody does, and particularly our Patreons who keep this show going. Uh, I don't think they even mm -hmm. get enough mention early enough in the show. So I, I think with that, I'll say thank you. We're going to hit an ad break, and we'll be back. Uh, we're going to talk some Sammy Umtiti after this. All right, back from that fun ad break. We both took a little bit of vacation, took some water. Now we're ready to go and ready to talk about Sammy Umtiti, a question from our good friend, an all-star here, uh, as far as questions go. Rick, he asks, Umtiti joins the 100 club with his performance against Celta. 100 appearances for Sammy Umtiti. Hope he gets a shout-out. Well, there it is, Rick, for such an achievement. His fourth season at the club. Where do you put him in the all-time best defenders for Barca? And how many more seasons do you think he has left until it's time to pass the baton to the young generation like Tadebo? Frances, do you mind if I go first on the all-time defenders list and then you hand in a second? For sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, go, go. So, Rick, I, I, was, I was thinking about this a lot, and Umtiti has certainly has ups and downs. Now, his best with the club, his, his first uh, about season and a half, he was, I think we had spoken about it, a top three to five defender in the world, center-back-wise. Uh, he was uh, uh, incredible just his his combination of ability on the ball uh, his passing obviously is is what it needs to be his physical uh strength coupled with his speed coupled with his ability to to, to snuff out counterattacks and be where he needed to be uh, barcelona's defense was uh, incredible right i think that was about right before the time when mark andre ter stegen was at his best where he he's become the mark andre ter stegen we know today it was the one that was um splitting time with claudio bravo at, or had just beat bravo in that race uh and uh, Ter Stegen was yet to be uh, Ter Stegen. So Umtiti fortifying the defense back then. All that said, though, 
I don't think he yet touches some of the famous ones when we talk about Pique, Puyol, Migueli, Rafael Marquez, Juan Segarra, Ronald Komand. Uh At the moment, I think a much better comparison of where he ranks in terms of uh, even modern-day Barcelona defenders. Again, I'm not going back too far, even though I said uh, Segarra and, and Migueli, but I think the comparison is Gabi Melito. 76 appearances from Melito. Tons of in- injuries which kept him on the bench, but he did play in a very talented Barcelona squad. Again, so it's only 76 for Melito, so maybe Humtiti's already surpassed him. Though Melito did come to Barca after the best of his career at Real Zaragoza, while Umtiti is hopefully not yet even in his prime at 25. So my hope is that if, if he's at the level where Melito w- was at for Barcelona... My hope is that he can stay healthy, and then certainly he's going to start knocking on the door, and he'll start go, hey, Rafael Marquez, maybe I'm as good as you, and he'll keep going up that list. So I don't think he's anywhere in the top pantheon just yet, but he certainly is a talented defender who has all the tools, and we've said that about younger players, but he is 25, so it's not like as I'm passing the I'm passing the put on on to uh, Todibo. Todibo's only 20. So he might not ever even feature for Barca regularly, depending on where his career goes, and we don't know what his future is but Umtiti's future is the player that we've already seen at Barcelona he's only 25 and if he can stay healthy and those knees are always a red flag we don't know if that will ever be the case but if it is if he's able to finally get right uh health wise we know that his best and his prime is one of the the best in the world and he could surely become I think a real legend but with that he's only 25 so I I don't mean to answer for you Frances but uh how many more seasons do it does he have left I don't know it's my it's not even how many seasons does he have it's how many seasons does his knees have that's the time where he's going to move on regardless of whether Tadeep or somebody else is prepared to take over the reins exactly I think I don't want to be too pessimistic here I think the best years of UTT we've already witnessed um I think his first year he was compared to Puyol very often because um, of of the aggressiveness and sort of sometimes craziness of their actions, um, craziness in a in a good way. I don't know if that can be classed as a good word, but anyway, um, he was a fighter, and he would be he would scare people off. You know, he would go for every single ball, not necessarily thinking about how am I gonna get the ball away, am I gonna tackle, am I gonna push, am I going to um, influence, am I going to position myself? But he just went and did it, and um, he was a huge fan favorite. Uh, especially at the Camp Nou. Um, it's not usual that the Camp Nou chants someone's name on the first season. That happened with MTT. And I really do think that he had all the tools. Obviously, we know, and I know from experience from my brother as well, like once injuries come, then your your body changes, um, not just your body, but also your mind, because you know what you could do before, then you sort of cannot do anymore. Um, that very risky sort of high race. um leg if if a ball is coming from the air to uh, to be controlled you may think about it twice um when you are thinking about things twice when you're on the pitch then that's when doubts happen and when doubts happen that's when injuries happen uh, once you're weak in any area i mean with me it was my ankles they just kept giving but with mtt it's his knees obviously and uh the problem is that every time he lands every time he runs every time he stops every time he turns changes direction he it's not sort of the first thing in his mind, but at the back of his mind, it's always there. So, unfortunately, your body never really goes back to to what it was after an injury like that. Um, obviously, having an injury is, uh, is a disgrace. It's, it's, you know, it's a desgracia. It's a very terrible uh, event that's happened. So, I don't want to go too harsh on him. But the thing is, when he got injured, the recommendation from the club was that he had an operation, basically. And... Uh, the World Cup with France was coming and uh, he refused the, the treatment. He took his own direction. And I think, to be honest, up to this day, he's still paying for the fact that he didn't listen to the medical advice from the club. And he decided to postpone all sorts of medical treatment. And, you know, he took, took a more conservative approach in order to play in the World Cup. Of course, he became a World Cup winner with that. So, you know, who can, who can blame him? But from a club perspective, the the club that actually pays his wages week in, week out. Um, I think I would have expected the player to get better to to serve the, the team that pays him. But, you know, the, uh, life is about choices. And he made a choice at that time. And I think he's still paying for it. So the future, I think he could still be a very valid player. But I don't think he's ever going to be as good as he should have been had the injury not happened. Well, speaking of not listening to medical advice, Guatham's question, PK stated in an interview that he is getting four to five hours of sleep due to his personal work and other activities, and he also states that the club accepts and understands it. Does this kind of player power inside the club 
uh, do any good, do more good than harm, uh, or more harm than good. Barcelona should not let players leave the club, is what is what Guacom says. Uh, and I mean, I, I'm no doctor, but it's not good. Obviously, four to five hours of sleep, and you know, I know people love to do this, and I'm going to do this here again. That when I'm playing in a game, and I think I've mentioned this on the pod, I do work in sports. Otherwise, I'm just a podcast, and so I work a lot of nights, and I'll get home at you know three a.m., four a.m., whatever it is. And there are times when I might have a game the next morning at 9 a.m. or 10 a.m., and so I'll get very limited sleep, and then I go and try to... My issue is I wind up... I just never catch my breath. I, I just seem to just be constantly be gasping and looking for water and, and things like that. And again, I'm not a professional athlete, and I don't have all the tools and, and, the, and the, the, the fancy bathtub and the fancy uh, electronics and all those things and the, and the fancy food and a chef and all that. But all that said, four to five hours of sleep, uh, that only happens for me, the night before that game. And I only, will, I only do that once a week or, 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 or twice if I absolutely have to. But if PK, if this is a regular thing, this is obviously a, it sounds like an excuse to me, but it also is a perfect indication of why I think his form has dropped the way it has, maybe even in recent weeks. And now he's coming out and saying this. So certainly this is an issue where, and I go back to the passion of it, that the fact that he's admitting this, and I don't know how much these quotes were taken out of context, but when it comes to saying getting four to five hours of sleep, it seems like those words that trend that's not going to be lost in translation, as we say. Like the, the, those words are going to work perfectly in English. And if that is the truth about PK and getting so little sleep by personal choice, uh, it, you do question his passion and his commitment to have his first priority being a first choice center back for Barcelona. And that is the most worrying thing, whether it's just PK, because again, we, I can't talk about, it's not a matter of the players ruling the club, but yeah, maybe it's an issue that the personnel and the board and all that are being lenient with PK doing this. But more importantly, I think the blame here, I stick on PK. When, when players choose to do things that jeopardize them being fully fit and reaching their full potential on the field, I, I think that starts with the responsibility of the players. Yeah, yeah, but you can also argue that Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, Michael Jordan, um, any other professional star in any other sport would have never done that. Yeah, LeBron and Kobe, that's a great point. LeBron and Kobe are famous for doing everything they possibly can. They have a lot of other interests, but they do everything they possibly can. LeBron James reportedly stretches two to three hours per day. Yep, yep, for sure. So, I mean, they would have never done it, point one. Point two, if they did it, which they wouldn't, they would never go in public to, to admit that because that, that means that, yeah, I'm doing the football thing as a part-time job. Um, he's getting paid, I think he's in, in the region of eight to nine million euros a year for sleeping five hours a day and then going to do the job. It's, it's not acceptable. But the thing is, it goes back to my 100% from earlier. Is there anyone in the club that's going to tell Piquet not to do that? Is there anyone really who has the authority and the willingness and the sort of foresight to tell him that? No, nobody. Valverde is not going to tell him because then he's going to mess up the dressing room against him. Uh, Bartomeu is not going to tell him either because, you know, he's too afraid of his popularity. And, and the thing is, these players have become bigger than the club itself. You know, I think in the, in the model of Messi, for example, Messi is a professional. He's always been and he's humble. But there's other people that have been there for many, many years that aren't doing what they're meant to do according to the contract and people are letting them get away with it. So I would be quite embarrassed to say anything like that, uh, well, to do anything like that. And I would certainly never go and say it. But I would expect my supervisors to, to take action. And neither of those three things are happening. No, and that, again, goes back to the responsibility that, that PK has to have in that kind of instance. Well, he, he already is, I guess, setting an example for uh, the players of, of in Andorra FC um, and, and some of his business interests that, that are well known. But, yeah, I think not only does the, it, the responsibility go on the player, but it does go around his circle. And, and that certainly goes back to the expectations of all the players and, and what they bring to the club. So, uh, unfortunately, I think we're ending it on a low note here, Frances. Uh, but I think that'll wrap it up for today's show. Apologies to those questions we didn't get to. I thought we had uh, some good, solid discussion here. So thanks so much for you tuning in again. You can tap in your app, uh, as we talked about before the ad break. You can check out the show notes to subscribe to the show. That's a big help. Do a rating, uh, no matter where you listen to the pod. Uh, give us a review. All those things really, really help to put these in people's ears and put it in front of people's eyes. Uh, we're also on social media, on Twitter, at the Barcelona Pod or at Hilton D13 for me. So all you need to do is just hit retweet on, uh, I send out a tweet for every pod. Same thing on Instagram. 
You just make sure people can see that. It's at the Barcelona Pod. Closed Facebook group, that's where we got these questions. tbpod.link backslash group. Deeper dives and discussion. And the best way to help the show, as always, is Patreon. It's $3. You can help us continue to make these shows. Uh, and more importantly, if you want to stop hearing airplanes overhead, if you want to stop, uh, if you want things to be a little bit better, uh, that's tbpod.link backslash Patreon. That helps out uh, so much with all the things behind the scenes here. And also, as I mentioned, we're on YouTube now at the Barcelona Podcast. I'm trying to get uh, new, different ideas every single week out. Uh, Again, this week's is about Elena Herrera. So you dig a little deep about the history of Barcelona. And as they always say, Frances, if we don't learn from our history, we're doomed to repeat it. And that was the idea that I, cu- I took from uh, for this week between Valverde and uh, Herrera. So check us out there. Hit that subscription button. And thanks so much for listening to the Barcelona podcast. Until next time, I'll talk to you soon. Forza Barca. Forza. <laughs>